Amen. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John chapter 4. Uh, today we are continuing in our series that we began last week titled Breakthrough. Uh, we are examining uh, the lives, uh, some stories of some just common individuals that had a, a really radical experience in their relationship with Christ, a radical transformation, uh, if you would. And today, uh, we are going to see one that for many of you uh, is a very familiar story. I think it's an incredible story. Uh, it's a, you'll know her as the woman at the well. We're going to know her today as the bad Samaritan. You all know the story of the Good Samaritan and what he did. We're going to see today that there also are bad Samaritans, and yet the need for both is the same. Uh, John chapter 4, if you found your place there, say amen. Now, there's more of you in here than that. If you found it, how about the rest of you? Say amen. There you go. It's just us, okay? Hey, and by the way... Um, I want to just make mention, I know we're having some internet issues this morning with our live streaming. Just say to those of you who are trying to uh, follow along with us, we are working on it. So hang in there with us and hopefully we'll get that up and going here in just a moment. Um, chapter four, verse three uh, and following, the Bible says, and he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Very, very important verse. He needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sachar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then a woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Verse 13 says, and Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give to him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may never thirst again nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said I have no husband for you've had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped here on this mountain. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where one, is, one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Father, we pause to say thank you as we always do for the word of God. 
For it is through it that, Lord, you reveal yourself. It is through it that you speak to us. It's through it that you guide us and comfort us and correct us and you nurture us. You give us songs, as the Bible says, in the night seasons through your word. Help us today through your word to see Jesus high and lifted up. Help us today through your word to have an encounter with Jesus. Lord, help me now to preach your word. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. This morning I speak to you on this subject talking about the life-changing story of the bad Samaritan. What I want to do, I want to walk through in our time we have and, and kind of chronicle, if you will, the, the, the path that she took uh, to experience a breakthrough. What's really interesting is, and I said this I think last week, all of us have moments in time in our life that we need a breakthrough, right? Right? Uh, we, we've come up against a wall, we've, we, we're, we're in the middle of a mess, and we need something to bring about some relief. A lot of folks have felt that way. As a matter of fact, in the last months, we've, we've, we've uh, seen that, that suicides are at an all-time high because often people are feeling very disconnected, their depression is, is running wild, and, and what did they, they needed a breakthrough. They needed some relief, and that's how they felt like that they were going to uh, get that relief, which obviously is not true, but the enemy is so slick and sly at, at lying to us that people buy into it. And so today I want to walk through, and it's, I think it's a really simple approach, but it, it, it's powerful in how she went about experiencing a, a breakthrough of her own. The very first thing we notice here in her journey through a breakthrough is that she had an encounter with Jesus. And when I say an encounter, I'm not talking about, hey, just some happenstance running into him. I'm talking about she had a divine appointment with Jesus. Now, I want to I wanna kind of pique your interest just a little bit and maybe stir your imagination. I want you to imagine that you're lost in the woods. Anybody ever, I know no man's going to admit to this. Any, any of y'all ever been lost in the woods? Okay, a couple of you guys, okay. And, and so most of us say, I wasn't lost. I just didn't fully know where I was, right? I want you to imagine lost in the woods, you no clue where you are, no clue how to get to where you're going, and you don't have, and, and by the way, I'm not just talking about a bad day deer hunting, I'm talking about it's winter, you don't have the supplies necessary to survive the night. Y'all with me? Say, uh-huh. You know it's getting ready to get really serious, and the only way that you're going to make it is that somebody's going to have to find you and rescue you. Y'all with me? You got a little bit of anxiety yet? A little bit of panic setting in? The sun's about to set? It's getting colder. You don't have what you need. And you need a breakthrough. You need something to happen. You need somebody to come along, find you in your state of complete and utter hopelessness and create a rescue. That's exactly where this woman was at, except for she didn't fully realize that she was lost. Do you know that she represents so many people that are in our society, the masses literally wandering through life? They have no hope, but yet they don't fully understand that they are lost. They need an encounter. She has an encounter with someone who is about to deliver her from her bondage. And as we read this here again, I don't want you to think that this was just one of those things where, boy, good thing she ran into Jesus. I mean, imagine what would happen if he went the other way. This wasn't a chance. This was, and this is why I said it was important to remember that verse, verse four, but he needed to go through Samaria. Why did he need to go through Samaria? No good Jew would have went through Samaria. They just wouldn't have done it. They were at odds with all of the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans. It's really as bad as the Samaritans hated the Jews. Why would he do that? Here's why. It wasn't the pattern, nor the mission of Jesus to only go to those who were like him or to reach out to those with prominence. By the way, this preacher's thankful about that. He didn't just reach out to those that looked like him, that sounded like him, talked like him, lived like him but that Jesus was interested in the here's, the, here's the word, the whosoever wills. 
He said he desired that whosoever will might come, that none would perish and that all come to repentance. If you do a little bit of research, you'll find that the Samaritans were a mixed race. They were part Jew, they were part Gentile. They, that grew out of the uh, captivity from the Assyrians, from the, what is known as the northern ten tribes uh, of Israel that took place back in about 727 B.C. They re- were rejected by the Jews because they couldn't prove their genealogy, which was a big deal. I'm thankful that we're not all completely hung up on that in our culture, that we don't have to walk around and say, let me prove to you who my daddy was. Most people don't give a rip who your daddy is. I'm thankful for that. The Samaritans had even gone so far as they set up their own temple, their own religious services on a place called Mount Gerizim, which, by the way, further fanned the flames of racism from the Jews and prejudice against the Samaritans. And by the way, it was mutual. I'm not putting it all on the Jews. It was mutual. And I'm just thankful that they got all that settled and there's no racism anywhere in the world today. Let me make a statement to you. I haven't spoke much about this. This side of heaven, there will never be a day that racism is completely eradicated. Y'all okay? Let me say this. Racism is as evil and disgusting and despicable today as it was in that day. It's still wrong. There's no place for, certainly, because I'm, I'm, so I'm talking to you right now, certainly for a Christian to embrace any form of racism. It's, it's, it's a wicked, wicked, evil thing for you to do. God's not okay with it. He condemns it. It was wrong then and it's wrong now. Yet what's interesting about it, and let me step off in something here. We can do all different kinds of things in regards to the issue of racism. Remember everything from marches to movements to uh, legislation to laws. But listen to me, all of that, and I'm not even, I'm not even speaking out against that. All of that, however, will fall short if the gospel is not inserted. The only true remedy for any form of racism is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the gospel that changes hearts. Amen, preacher. So intense was the Jews' dislikes for the Samaritan that, that the history would tell us that it wasn't uncommon to find Jews praying that no Samaritan would be raised in the resurrection. That's radical. I, 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 I can't overstate they hated each other. This is deeper than the Bloods and the Crips or the Hatfields and the McCoys. I just thought I'd give you a pretty good wide swath of folks there. As a matter of fact, whenever Jesus' own enemies wanted to call him an insulting name, they would often refer to him as a Samaritan. I'm thankful that it didn't then, nor does it today, deter him in any way. And though, by the way, I realize you won't go up and find or have an encounter with Jesus at you know, Sonic or the New Harps, okay? We still today, in as much of a real way as they did then, can experience an encounter with the living God. You say, well, how do you do that? I'm thankful you brought the question up. Romans 10 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? I love this. Listen to verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. That's how we encounter Christ today is through his word. The only way that I have faith is by hearing of the word. Apart from the word of God, I don't know who God is. God may as well be a tree or a squirrel. And by the way, that explains a lot of where we are in America. There's a lot of folks that are worshiping trees and squirrels. Some of them are a bunch of squirrels. It's the word of God that sets us up for an encounter with God. That's why it's so important. That's why there's nothing more important than I will say to you today than what I have just read to you from the word of God. How can they call on him in whom they've not believed? How can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless there's a preacher? How can he preach unless he is sent? You see, if you reverse that, it gives us some great encouragement, does it not? We send people so that they would go and preach. We, that we have them to preach so that others would hear. They'll hear so that they might believe. And if they believe, then they will follow and obey. This is why we're ascending church. This is why it isn't our mission as a church to just gather all we can gather. Our mission as a church is as we gather them to equip them, train them, and launch them back out to do it again. Why? Because people need to hear the gospel. So she had a, on her pathway to a breakthrough, an encounter with Jesus. Second thing we see in the text is she had a, a growing understanding of who Jesus is. You see, it's not enough for us to just have an encounter. You'll all have, a, at some level, an encounter today. It's, by the way, likewise, it's not a, it's not a coincidence or just an accident that you're here. Now, you may be here today thinking, well, I'm only here to watch a baptism, or I'm only here because a, a, a buddy had invited me, or I'm only here because grandma won't leave me alone. And it's a good way to get grandma to leave me alone. Oh, by the way, and she'll cook lunch afterwards if I come to church. Just remind you, God's too big into details for that to be a chance. It's called a divine encounter. He, he's, he's, just so that you'll know, let you in on the inside, you've been set up. You have. Not by your grandma, well, maybe by your grandma, but, but more importantly, you've been set up by God. You see, here again, keep, keep the dots connected You'll not have faith apart from hearing the word of God. But the problem is that's not enough. Just to have that encounter, what, just take, what begins to take place in her life, this bad Samaritan lady, is that she has now this growing understanding of who Jesus is. It was in that day considered very, very improper for any man, especially a, a Jewish rabbi, to speak to a strange woman in public. It just didn't happen. And if it did, it was scandalous. Yet here, and I love this about Jesus, he sets aside the social customs, if you will, and he did so because eternity was at stake for this woman. You see, Jesus put people over processes and policies. Jesus majored on the major, and guess what we often do in church is we get lost in all of the details of life and put people as secondary. People should be the primary for us, congregation, amen? That, that should be what we're impressed with, not with crowds. You say, well, in crowds, just a bunch of people. You're missing the point. Jesus often in crowds wasn't going, my, boy, we're getting popular, Peter. Look what we've drawn in. No, Jesus often found the individual in the crowd that everybody else couldn't see. you notice, do you look through our story, how her understanding of Jesus develops? First, she notices him as a Jew, maybe even a, a teacher. Then she begins to talk about and discovers that he's even greater than what they would call their father Jacob, was as Jacob's well. Then she sees him as a prophet because he starts messing with her sin. And then, well, I'll get, I'll get to the last one here in just a moment, but, but it didn't stay where it was. And by the way, it won't for you either. 
And, and, and just so I'm letting you know, I'm, I'd be a terrible poker player. I'm letting you know where I'm going. I'm setting you up. I, I am. Being in here this morning, let me tell you where I'm headed. I'm giving you some truth today that you'll make a decision about. And you may say, well, I, not me, preacher. I ain't making no decision. Yes, you will. Every, did you realize that every time any of us hear truth, we make a decision what we'll do with it? You say, well, no, I'm going to delay my decision. That's a decision. That's a decision. And in that moment, it's a decision to reject. Jesus begins to explain to this woman who he is and why he was there and what he was about. And I, I love how when Jesus witness to people. It wasn't just this canned approach. I've been guilty of that. You have a canned approach that you just kind of morph it into wherever you were or wherever you're at. Jesus wasn't trying to sell something. Jesus met that individual where they were and dealt with what they were dealing with. Matter of fact, if you go look at, he had just got done talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus. When he talked to Nicodemus, he spoke about new birth. But to this woman, he begins talking about something called living water. And I love her response. I want some of that living water. And Jesus points out to her that she was ignorant about a few things. One, she was ignorant about who he was. Two, she was ignorant about what he had to offer. And three, she was most ignorant about how she would go about receiving it. But in her growing understanding of who Jesus was, she also, this is so critical, had to come to the reality of who she was. You see, there's a, I don't know if I'd say a movement, there's a, there's a pressure today as we gather as a church to say, hey, could we, could we dial back that whole stuff about like heaven and hell? I mean, you talk about heaven, everybody loves heaven, right? Isn't that convenient? Everybody loves that. But could we be a little bit more seeker sensitive? Can we, can we be a little bit just, just sweeter? Don't, don't, I mean, and by the way, for sure, don't tell people they're sinners. Don't, don't bring that up. That's offensive, preacher. I get that sin is offensive, but yet to no one any more than it is to a holy God who the only way he could keep you and I out of hell was to kill his own son. His love for us is that incredible. Isn't that, that, isn't that unbelievable? His love for, and by the way, let's get honest about it. Now, I'm not talking about the church you, I'm talking about the real you. He knew that you, and yet still says, I want a relationship. I'm blown away by that kind of love. I'm impressed by that kind of love. That's the kind of love that he's extending to this bad Samaritan woman. He begins to deal with her sin and she gets incredibly uncomfortable. And by the way, that's not a new thing. The gospel always has been and the gospel always will be offensive. Someone said the only way to prepare the soil of the heart for the seed is to plow it up with conviction. That's why Jesus told her, he said, well, go get your husband." He forced her to admit her sin. This is where in, in our culture, we, we don't want to admit that. And here's why. We can always find somebody that's worse. I mean, can't you? I mean, even in here this morning, I guarantee it may take me most of the morning to get done. I could find somebody in here that I can out-Christian. I mean, think about it, couldn't you? I mean, just, let's just take a little example. Just look around. Go ahead, turn your head around. It's not a sin, just look around. Let's just judge one another. Can't you find somebody, amen? I mean, you're looking at them. I mean, I feel like all the eyes are on me. It's like, I can beat you, preacher. We, we, we all could find that individual. All of us can find that one. Matter of fact, a lot of us could find a whole lot of folks that we can look at and go, <laughs> seriously. I mean, who couldn't out-Christian her? It's uncomfortable dealing with that truth that says, for all, listen to me, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus here had awakened her mind. 
He had stirred her emotions, but he also had to touch her conscience. He also had to deal with the very issue that she had of dealing with her sin. There will be no conversion if there is no conviction. Nobody will ever be saved that doesn't first come to the understanding they are lost. I know it's uncomfortable. I know that there's some of you, the moment I started talking about that, you probably just checked out. I, bless God, I knew he was going to start talking meddling. Meddling. Listen, I love you too much. You just sit in here and say, hey, you're okay. I'm okay. All dogs go to heaven. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to love you enough to say, you have the same problem that I got. Sin. We're all in the same boat. Sin. Now, we're not getting together to have a sin party, but we are here today to have a Savior party that all of us sinners can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the one Savior who died for all sin everywhere of all time and invites you and I to be saved. The woman, she said, I have no husband. It was... It was the shortest statement she made in the whole conversation. Maybe because she was under conviction. But what's interesting that just catches my eye every time I read this story is how immediately, did you notice she changed the subject? He, he talks to her about her husband. You're, you're right, you, you have no husband. You had five of them. Holy smokes, five husbands. The guy you've got now is not your husband. And immediately, rather than her saying, could you help me? She starts talking about religion. Isn't that interesting? You, you think that anybody does that today? I'm telling you, this is, it's, it's almost in one sense comical. It's not, but uh, you kind of have to chuckle at times whenever you ask somebody. Because here's a, here's a question I'll ask often. Hey, do you go to church anywhere? That's just a great way to start a conversation. You go to church anywhere? Here's what I get. Everything from, oh, yeah, absolutely, I'm a member up so-and-so, I'm born again, blah, 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 all the way to, oh, uh, well, um, my grandma knows a guy where she buys flour whose uncle's, uh, no, whose, whose brother's sister's cousin owns a church. Is that in Arkansas? <laughs> People get real uncomfortable, right? When we start dealing with real heart issues and spiritual. And so guess what they do? They, they change the subject. They, they start, well, yeah, I, I know, you know, I know, yeah, but I know. And they don't say anything. It's just, I know. That's, that's Americanese religion is what that is. She switched the subject because it was much more comfortable for her to talk about religion and all. And by the way, there are so many problems with religion. Amen? There is. Remember, let me say this. Religion will send you to hell. Religion will send you to hell. It's a relationship with Jesus as the only remedy to get you out of hell into a place called heaven. First she encounters him, then she begins to understand who he is. And lastly, she had a decision to make about it all. She had to have a faith belief in Jesus. In spite of her ignorance about Jesus, what was interesting was she, she had a, a, a knowledge of truth about Messiah that was coming. She said, Messiah's coming and he's going to reveal um, all of these things, the secrets of the heart. And what's interesting, we're, we're not sure, even to this day, where she learned all that. We don't know. How did this woman come to find out about Messiah that is coming? We don't know, but here's what we are assured of. God uses the seeds of truth that are planted in people's hearts that may not bear fruit for sometimes years to come. There's times that I preach and I look out at y'all and I go, 
They ain't listening. They ain't listening a single word I'm saying. Some of y'all on your smartphones, half of you look like you're asleep. Some of you wishing you were asleep and you can't sleep. Boy, isn't that the worst, amen? Try to sleep through a sermon and you can't get there. And I go, ain't nobody paying attention to what I'm saying. There's been times that I've got up and I've preached and it preached as, as good and as hard and passionate as I could. And it, and it was so bad. And I, I wish I, this were not true. It was so bad. I literally feel like I should have walked back up here and said, sorry. Pray that next week's better. I just, you know, sometimes you swing and you miss. I just felt so bad about it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm genuine. You can ask Pastor Brooks. I tell him this often. I've told my bride this often. It's like, it just was terrible today. I'm my own. I know some of y'all think that God sent you here to be my critic. I'm telling you, you, you're not worse than I am about me. And I'm still amazed at this day. How often it is that in the middle of those moments, somebody will come out just blubbering, crying, snot. And say, God spoke to me through your sermon. I'm going, not through that one, he did it. Uh Uh-uh. What's going on, preacher? I'm telling you, the word of God's powerful. It's not about who's preaching. It's not about where they're preaching it. But it is about the very fact that the word of God is powerful. It's sufficient for the salvation of souls. Here this woman puts her faith in Christ. He He confesses to her this Messiah you speak of. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Huh? Hey, oh boy, you're talking about right here. I would love to see Jesus' face. Maybe he was just stoic. It's me. I don't know how he did it. But I would love to have watched her face and her jaw just drops like, "Uh uh-uh. What? Shut up. Are you... I don't know how it went down, but in my mind, that's how it went. You're, mm. Here again, this is why it's good for you to really not just read your Bible, but to study your Bible, because you'll find some cultural things that, just, that just, just make this huge. Here, as she's put her faith in Jesus, Immediately, this woman wants to go to town and tell them all who she met and what he did. This woman hadn't gone to a class yet. She hadn't been discipled yet. This woman hadn't uh, been a part of the WMU or the, the women's auxiliary. This woman hadn't been to small group. This woman hadn't even been baptized or taken communion yet. She hadn't joined the local church. But immediately... As this woman is saved, she's like, I got to go to town. And she ain't shopping either, girls. I, mean, she, I guess she's shopping for souls. I've got to get to town. It's common for the rabbis to say, it's better that the words of the law be burned than to be delivered to a woman. And here again, Jesus, bucking the trend of prejudice, not only embraces this woman and her new life, but he's commissioned her, he sent her out as he sends us out to be a gospel witness. Yeah, she's the most, they're the least likely prospect for salvation. She should have been passed up. She should have been looked over, yet God uses her to win almost an entire village to Christ. Look at the text with me very quickly. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, went her way to the city, And said to the men, here it is, verse 29, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Drop down to verse 39. 39 says, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him, Jesus, because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. 
I'm deeply encouraged, yet so convicted, and yet even confused as I read this. And I'll close right here. I have to just wonder if if God used this bad Samaritan woman this way, how much he wants to use you and I. I have to also say, if this woman had not been trained and yet she still went to do what she did, just couldn't help it, I gotta go to town tell. Why on earth have so many of us spent a lifetime in the church, been through every kind of training known to man, and yet still won't walk across the street to tell somebody about Jesus. There's only one Holy Spirit. Y'all agree? Amen? It's not a trick. Is it just one? Only one Jesus, only one God. When I got saved, 11 o'clock at night, tax day. Ain't nobody wants to hear from anybody on tax day. I made two or three phone calls that night. Let me tell you why. Was it because I had a quota? Was it because I had to put ping pong balls in the invite board out there? I couldn't believe what had just happened to me. I mean, it, it, it already, I'm, I'm, I'm minutes into this new life. And I had people immediately that I needed to tell. Very next day, I began to share the gospel. That week, I had the opportunity to lead my best buddy, Goob, to Jesus. You say, why are you telling that? Here's why. I hadn't gone to a class yet. I hadn't been trained yet. I had more theological questions than I certainly had answers. But inside of me, there was this burning desire to say, man, if he could change me this much, Think about how much he could change my buddy Goob. Because, I mean, Goob was just bad a sinner as I was. He was there when I did most of my sinning. And I'm just asking the question. How can we today say, born again, preacher, walking with Jesus, and yet not have the same passion, the same drive, as this woman who should not have probably ever even heard, according to customs, the gospel, to go into our city, our village, our school, our home, our neighborhood, our workplace, and tell the folks there, come see a man who's told me everything I ever did. Maybe this morning, maybe for you it's because you've never yet experienced the breakthrough that she had. Maybe you've had an encounter with him. Maybe you have uh, somewhat of an understanding, but maybe you're also at that place that you've never taken a step of faith to say, I wanna wanna trust him. That was my story. I'd encountered him my whole life. Been around the word of God my whole life. I knew a lot about him because of Bible teaching, but I'd never surrendered by faith to him. And as I tell you, you'll never know what it is to have a breakthrough without a step of faith. He always requires faith. 